Hello, everyone. I'm excited today. I've got with us Conrad Weaver. He's a producer, director of documentary films at Conjo Studios, podcaster, an extraordinary guy. Stick around. You don't want to miss this episode. Welcome to the Your Mark on the World show with your champion of social good, Devin D. Thorpe. This episode is made possible via the support of our sponsors, including Johnson & Johnson's Caring Crowd. Conrad, welcome to the show. Well, thanks so much for having me. Well, it's a pleasure to be have you on the show. Uh, I appreciated you having me on your show recently. It was really an honor to, to, to be a guest on your show. And we're, well, that was fun. <laughs> it was, it was for sure. Thank you very much for joining me today. Um, I am so excited to talk about your new film. Uh, is it Heroin's Grip? Is that what yes, it is? it's Heroin's Grip. It's a story about the opioid crisis. That is just such a, an important topic. You know, and it's one that we've been talking about increasingly for a decade at least, and yet I still feel like it's such an uncomfortable topic, and there's so much mystery surrounding this topic that people just don't quite understand or know what to do. So your film has the potential to really help advance the the effort of humanizing the people that are stuck in heroin's grip. So tell us about your experience in making this film. So, you know, I like to say that I was just a guy living in a neighborhood and doing my thing and not directly connected to anyone in addiction or caught up in this thing. And I kept seeing these stories in the news and kept hearing stories of local families who had lost their loved ones, their kids. And my kids went to high school with some of these people who lost their lives. And I decided I could no longer just sit on the sidelines and turn my head and ignore the problem. I had to jump in and get involved. And for two years, I spent time with people that I never dreamed I would spend time with. People that were using heroin, using opiates, uh, police officers who were going into, you know, scenes of overdose uh, events, uh, and EMS workers, and others who were on the front lines of this epidemic. And it was an amazing two-year experience. And we really, our goal was exactly like you said, is to humanize these folks who get caught up in this horrible addiction. And I learned so much, and it changed my attitude. It changed my opinion about people in addiction, it changed, it, it gave me an insight into addiction that I never understood before. And so I really made the movie for people like me. But what, what are some of the insights you got from the experience that you hope people take from the movie? So I, I think the first thing, and sorry about that, first thing is that I feel that people need to understand that this can impact anyone. It can be, it, it doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter what your socioeconomic status is. It doesn't matter, uh, you know, I mean, you could be a 4.0 student. You can be a doctor, a lawyer, a, you know, you can be a sanitation worker. It doesn't matter. Anyone can get caught up in this. And we've seen all of them. And I talked to somebody uh, about a year and a half ago, and they said they met this this gentleman at their local health club, and he was sweeping the floors. And this gentleman started talking to them, and they said that, you know, I used to be a successful doctor. I had a big mansion on the hill. I had I had the world at my fingertips, and I started using opiates, and pretty soon I was using heroin, and then I lost everything. I ended up in jail, and Today, I lost my medical license, so today all I can do is sweep the floor at this gym. Wow. Yeah. And so, you know, it used to be our, our, our thinking was it's those people in the cities. It's, it's that what we used to call a junkie on the street corner, you know, selling her body. It's, it's still that. It's still that person, that human being on the street corner selling her body. But today, it's also my neighbor and your neighbor and the, the, the kid down the street and, and the you know, 35 year old that's working you know, a job, it's, it's yeah. everyone. It seems that that also gives us fresh insight into the 
heroin addicts we've always seen, the ones we've labeled junkies on the corner, uh, when you realize that doctor, lawyer, baker, doesn't matter, you, you get, you, you play with this stuff, you're likely to get hooked, right? It is absolutely, and we, we interviewed a doctor from Baltimore, he's a leading researcher in, in the opiate crisis and in addiction, and he gave us the most vivid description of what happens in the brain when opiates hit the brain. And it's unbelievable how it literally rewires the brain. So you take heroin one time and it literally rewires the brain. So now all you can think about is where can I get that next feeling, that next high, that next. So it's like he said, so we all have things in our life that give us pleasure. Drinking a cup of coffee, having a glass of wine, playing baseball, just whatever gives us pleasure. And it, it and it kind of feeds us these small hits of endorphins that give us pleasure. He said what opiates do, it, it feeds us a sledgehammer of endorphins. So you get hit with this big hit of endorphins and that pleasure is the best feeling that you've ever experienced. And so now all you want to do is go back to that and to have that feeling again. The problem is you'll never have that feeling again at that level. And so you're just chasing that, that high, that, that feeling of pleasure. And the more you use to chase that, the more you have to use to try to hit those levels. And it just, it's a vicious cycle. And pretty soon you're sticking needles in your arm and you're getting dope sick and you're selling your body or you're doing things you'd never imagined you would do to get that feeling. One of the things that I understand has been increasing the fatality rate is the introduction of fentanyl into the heroin market. Did you look at that? We, we looked at it from the standpoint of it's what's causing a lot of overdoses. We didn't dive into the, uh, the real you know, nitty gritty. We did talk about it briefly in the film that it's this fentanyl is coming over from China, mostly from what, what it's called bucket labs, these, these underground illegal laboratories that are, that are, you know, making this stuff. I mean, it's purely chemicals that they're putting together to make this stuff and then shipping it over here. And really that is what's killing most people today. I talked to a gentleman a couple of weeks ago from Ohio, which has been at the, really the ground zero for a lot of this. And he said in his immediate area in Ohio, there have been no heroin overdoses or, or fatalities to speak of in a couple of years. It's all fentanyl. Wow. And that's what's coming in. So they're mixing fentanyl's a lot cheaper than heroin, so they can mix it in with the heroin. And these tiny- And heroin's grades, not expensive. Heroin's cheap. Heroin's cheap already. And so now they're mixing in something even cheaper. And if the dosage isn't right, it kills you. I think on the streets of Salt Lake City, where I live, a, uh, a hit of heroin would cost about, you know, five to 10 bucks. Mm -hmm. uh, is that what your research showed? That's probably about right. Uh, you know, I know they say that in Baltimore, you can get a gram of heroin, which is quite a bit of heroin for about a hundred bucks. So, and I don't know how many, you know, how many injections that is good for, but yeah. uh, it, it'll last a little while. Uh, here where I live in Frederick County, Maryland, just 50 miles to the West, it's probably 150, 200 bucks. And so consequently, most of the users are going to down to Baltimore to buy their dope. Because that's because it comes into Baltimore from the ports or from other places. And so, the reason, one reason it's so prevalent here in our region is because of Baltimore and the, and the, uh, the trafficking that happens there. Uh, so, uh, and, and the ironic thing is when users hear that a particular dealer is selling dope that is killing people, that's what they want. They want that because that's the good stuff. And so they go buy this stuff that, oh, you know, this guy sold, dope to people and three people died. Well, 
he must have some good stuff. And so let's go get that. And it's, yeah. it's crazy that that's how it works. You'd think, you know, any other business, you know, you're kill, you kill your customers, that's bad for business, right? Yeah. But in the dope business, it's just the opposite. Wow. What else did you learn about the trafficking business as you were working on the film? You know, I spent uh, quite a bit of time with our local service department. I did ride-alongs with them. And uh, they are looking for dope. You know, they, we, we sat along the highway and we, we watched cars come by. And these guys are trained to spot the, the dope in the car. It's just, you know, traveling by 70 miles an hour, they can spot it. And it's, um, it was unbelievable to see uh, how they can, just how the person is driving and, and the, the certain telltales that, indicates that this person may have be carrying dope and uh, would, wow. you know, would pull in behind these people and they have to have some kind of traffic violation for them to turn on the lights. But usually that's not hard to find, especially, you know, police car pulls in behind you, you're gonna get nervous and you might weave a little bit or, you know, you might not use your turn signals properly. And so lights come on and an officer approaches the car, you know, there's telltale signs even then that this person or individual may be carrying drugs. And so if they see those signs, then they can call for canine unit to come do a sniff test. And, you know, I, I was there when they found dope. And wow. this officer would say that this guy is carrying dope. I know he is. I know how he's acting. He's, he's got all the signs. So they bring the dog and sure enough, they're carrying dope. And so, and, and so I-70 becomes a corridor coming from the west. So from states further west to, to Baltimore, uh, some of the heroin even comes in through shipping containers into Baltimore, the port. And so that kind of trafficking is, is prevalent everywhere. I mean, if you look at where heroin and overdoses are prevalent in America, you see it along the interstate systems. So north and south, I-95, I-75, through Cincinnati and up, up to Detroit, I-70 across the, the center of the country. That's the, really the shipping lanes of where a lot of this dope is, is trafficked from. Just a couple months ago, a state trooper here in Maryland pulled over a semi-truck and they found one of the largest shipments of heroin that they ever found in, in our state. And they kind of had a tip that this was coming and so they were able to uh, nail him and they wow. searched him and sure enough, he had it on him. Wow. Let's talk a little bit about filmmaking, if you don't mind. Uh, sure. So w when you decided to make this film, you made a number of other films, you do corporate work and other work for clients who are paying you. How, what are the, uh, how's the business of this film made? Did someone pay you to do this up front? Uh, or how do you expect to be paid? So documentary work is always a challenge. Uh, it's, it's oftentimes a passion project. Uh, and this has really become a passion project for me because once I dove into it, it's like, okay, whether or not I raise any money to make this film, I'm gonna make this film because it's such an important topic. And so what I would do with all of my films, I figure out who the stakeholders are. Who are those people who like this subject, who are involved in this, this thing? And I go after them and I figure out, you know, I ask them for money. I just say, hey, can you fund this film? We put together a business plan and, and a, a marketing plan and we pitch it to them and we get, uh, on this one, it's not investors, so these are donors. And usually we have a nonprofit that we run that funding through so that uh, a business can write a check for $10,000 and get a tax benefit from that. And so that's how I funded all of my films. And on the back side, we are just in distribution now for Heroin Script. We did a short theatrical run and uh, we're now booking events around the country. We are, and we get a screening fee for that, an honorarium for that. Uh, eventually later this year, we're gonna uh, launch it on Amazon and so it'll be widely available on Amazon so we can monetize that. And, and uh, you know, I, I have to pay the bills, so it's nice to get paid for my efforts. I spent two years, uh, you know, we raised $60,000 for this film. It's, it's, it's just a drop in the bucket, really, what, for what I really needed. 
because yeah. the hours and hours and hours I spent on this film. And for two years, uh, I did a few other projects that helped pay the bills, but uh, you know, this is basically what I did for two years. And so, you know, fortunately I have a wife that has a really good job. <laughs> good. <laughs> and we uh, kind of, her salary helps even out the ups and downs in my business. So uh, uh, oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, Conrad, as you looked at heroin and the opioid epidemic, um, what do you see as you come away from this experience as uh, the solution or a solution or a part of the solution? You know, from the beginning, my thoughts were this, that the solution lies with all of us. You know, it's not a Baltimore City problem. It's not a Frederick City problem or a Salt Lake City problem. It's our problem. It's the community's problem. And we all need to work together to, to help people who are suffering, to help people who are going through challenges. And really looking at this, the reason people get into drugs is there's some kind of challenges in their life. There's, there's pain. There could be, be trauma. There's other things like that that cause someone to say, you know what, I'm going to try this to dull the pain in my life. And I think what we need as a society to do is to be there for each other, to support each other. Uh, just the other week, we had a screening event at a, a large church down the road here, and there was over 600 people came to see this film. And one of the families that's featured in my film attends this church. And another friend of mine came to me after the screening and he said, I sit behind that family every Sunday. I had no idea this is what they were going through. I had no idea that the amount of pain and struggles that they were going through because of their son's addiction. And I think if, so therein lies that issue of stigma. So, this family may not have talked about their issue because of the stigma behind addiction. Today, they're much more vocal. They've been in the film, so they're much more open about it. But I think if we help alleviate, uh, eliminate that stigma behind it, then f people, individuals, families may be more willing and open to talk about the addiction problem in their family so that the rest of us can rally around them and be a support for that person, that individual, that family. For example, if, if you find out that I have cancer, everybody comes and they help out. How can I support you? We start a GoFundMe account to help get you treatment, you know, but we don't do that for addiction. We don't go to our neighbor and say, hey, can I start a GoFundMe account? I know that you spent all of your, your retirement funds to pay for your son's recovery. Can we start a GoFundMe account to help you? And that's something that we need to look at as a society to, to bring us together to support these folks that are caught up in this. Yeah, yeah that's a great, great observation. Powerful. Conrad, what are you most proud of having accomplished in your career? Wow. That's a, that's a deep question, I guess. Um, I think what I potentially will be most proud of when I come to the end of the road looking back, is that the films that I've produced, the projects that I've worked on, the things that I've been able to have the privilege of doing have helped change people's lives in some way. Maybe it's just making them feel better uh, for the moment. Uh, I, I produced a documentary called The Great American Wheat Harvest. It's a story about these harvesters traveling across the country and 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 we had so we had thousands of people who just absolutely loved that film and it gave them like this nostalgic memory of their childhood of growing up on the farm and so that gives me pleasure I, I, that's like wow i can give you a little you know boost of pleasure for what you experienced when you were a kid but ultimately i think it's making a difference if I, if I can make a difference in one person's life, and my goal with Heroin's Grip is if I can save one life, if I can, if one person is alive because of this film, then I've, it's worth 
all the pain and you know, toil to go through it. Sure. Well, Conrad, you've had a, a great career. You've done and learned so much. What, what do you think of as being the most important lesson you've learned? Hmm. I think one of the most important lessons I've learned is that people are resilient. People go through incredible difficulties, whether you're a farmer in the wheat field in Kansas or you're a family that's going through addiction, someone in your family. People are resilient and they pull themselves up with the help of others and they keep going. Um, you know, there are so many things in our lives that can destroy us, that can just knock us down. And But if we don't get up, and pull ourselves up and keep going, then we lose. And every time we pick ourselves back up and we keep going and we, we get stronger. And I see that everywhere I go. I mean, my second film, I produced a film about the drought in the West. And I saw cities and organizations and farmers who were struggling with you know, lack of water. I saw a family who had that the 70 year old woman had to go haul water every day so they could just flush the toilet. Yeah. Brilliant film, by the way. Brilliant film. Oh, well, thank you. And so this is the resilience that people have uh, and the support that people give to others is amazing. I mean, we live in an amazing nation that we help each other when the chips are down. And I think uh, we need to continue to do that and do more of that. Yeah. Conrad, as you reflect back, uh, you know, your work has centered around, as a filmmaker, centered around issues and nonprofits and changing the world. Uh, what drew you to that? How did you get there? Hmm. Probably from, I learned that from my parents. You know, I, I was a preacher's kid. And uh, being a preacher's kid, you're often in the middle of stuff you know, because mom and dad are working to help, you know. I remember we had, we had people stay with us that weren't part of our family. We had uh, some kids who stayed with us who had no family that were abused, they had family that were abusive. And so we had foster, we, we called them our foster sisters. They stayed with us. And so, and we would go help families that uh, would go I remember one time we visited his family and we walked into their kitchen and they had no food in the, in, in their pantries, nothing. And we just went, my parents just went down the grocery store and bought a couple hundred dollars worth of food and we delivered it. And so I think that having seen that firsthand from my parents, I think drove me to, you know, I got to do the same. I got to make a difference. I got to help others. I, I, I got to reach out to, to serve others and that, 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 I mean, there's nothing better that gives you more pleasure, that gives you more joy than to serve others. And, you know, if I can do that for the rest of my life, then I'll accomplish what I think God put me on this earth for. All right. What is your superpower? <laughs> do I have a superpower? <laughs> wow. That's an interesting question. So I think my superpower may be that I, I enjoy listening to others, hearing their story, and helping them share their story to make a difference. I think perhaps that's if there's a superpower like that, then that's maybe mine. Uh, <laughs> it's a great superpower. Great superpower. Well, Conrad, thank you so much for making time for us today. We really appreciate it. Uh, before you go, would you take just a minute and tell people again the best way for them to see uh, Heroin's Grip, to connect with you at Conju, uh, Conjo Studios, learn more about your work, and connect with you personally? Sure. So uh, Heroin's Grip, you can go to our website. It's heroinsgrip.com. 
and you can see our film trailer there. You can see where we're screening the film. You can even uh, sign a form to book a screening in your city. Uh, and we're taking those uh, everywhere. If people want to contact me directly, they can email me at conrad at conjostudios.com, conrad at conjostudios.com. I'm on Twitter. I'm on all the social medias, uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all that fun stuff. You, you can just search Conjo Studios, C-O-N-J-O, S-T-U-D-I-O-S, and you can find me there. Or you can just Google my name, Conrad Weaver, and I generally, I think, pop up on the first page. So, uh, <laughs> Fantastic. Well, Conrad, again, thank you so much for being with us today. We really appreciate you making the time for us. We wish you every success with the great work you're doing at Conjo Studios, and the, uh, we wish you success with Heroin's Grip. Well, I really appreciate that. Thank you for having me on the show. All righty. Let's do some good. Amen. Welcome to the Your Mark on the World show with your champion of social good, Devin D. Thorpe. This episode is made possible via the support of our sponsors, including Johnson & Johnson's Caring Crowd. 